Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this conversation, discussion, questions and answers session um, with uh, Professor Gilbert Ashkar from uh, SOAS. I'm Dina Matar, I'm the Chair of Center of Palestine Studies, and I also teach at the Center for Global Media and Communication at SOAS. And this is um, an event that um, I think is overdue where we need to talk about 10 years following the Arab uprising and what lessons we have learned and thinking about what is going on. Um, and we really have the best possible academic, um, can I say activist, uh, concerned person uh, to talk about this, Professor Ashkar. Uh, so we're really delighted to have him here to talk about his reflections and also around his, um, you know, kind of, uh, knowledge uh, around what, what is going on in the Arab world at the moment. And of course, while doing this, we have to remember um, all those people whose lives were lost, all those people who have been displaced in these uh, uprisings that were demanding really very basic human rights. And so we salute them and, uh, you know, we, um, we kind of um, are very uh, proud of the uh, agency in very difficult circumstances. Uh, so Professor Ashkar is a, a professor at the, in, in the Development Studies Department. He is uh, the esteemed author of many uh, important books, not the least uh, two books on uh, the Arab uprisings of 2011, uh, The People Want and Morbid Symptoms. The way we are going to do this is I'm going to pose some kind of opening questions to Gilbert unless he wants to start talking. Um, and then, you know, further questions and so on. So it'll be like, like a conversation um, and, and kind of um, we will try and finish in about uh, 40 minutes for zero minutes and then we will open to questions. So maybe it will be less than that. Maybe it'll be 30 minutes because we would like to have your intervention. So uh, the event is hosted by the uh, SOAS Middle East Institute, and uh, we thank them for their support for these events. Gilbert, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, Dean, I want to come in to, to thank you for having uh, uh, organized uh, this event. Uh, uh, I mean, you're right that uh, uh, SOAS should have been organizing something like this with our own staff. Uh, I, I remember when <clears throat> when uh, uh, I was uh, uh, appointed, uh, offered a chair at SOAS. And I told that to a French colleague who told me, oh, you're going to the Mecca of, uh, of uh, Middle East and North Africa studies. I, I remember the formula he, he used. And indeed, I mean, we, we have at SOAS uh, quite a pool of, of specialists, a unique pool of specialists of, uh, of the region. And, uh, and you are one of them, for sure. And we, most of us, all of us, actually, those who work on Middle East and North Africa have been working on various aspects of, uh, of uh, these, uh, this big upheaval that started uh, little more than 10 years ago. So, uh, so it's very appropriate that we organize this, even though it was done at a very short notice, because, uh, yeah, I mean, we, the decision was taken to organize this uh, this evening, the seminar, two, just two weeks ago. So I'm very glad to be here with you and uh, thank you again. Oh, thank you, Gilbert. And also thank you for all the participants who are here and for coming on this Wednesday evening. So we just want to start with a few kind of opening uh, questions. And, um, you know, it seems that the region, um, the Middle East and uh, North Africa seems to be kind of almost absent uh, from uh, the international discourse and in the, media, in the mainstream media discourse. But that doesn't mean nothing is going on. So I just wanted to kind of ask uh, Gilbert perhaps to reflect um, on uh, the kind of the debate that has become quite negative uh, about the region and about the Arab Spring. There's been a lot of uh, work around the Arab Spring turned into an Arab winter, for example. And, and try and say, um, are we you know, considering that there are popular mobilizations taking place in different parts of, of the region? Are we waiting for another 2011 moment? 
Um, well, uh, you are absolutely right to 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 point to the uh, uh, the the shifts in the discourses or in the, the, the in especially the media actually the media coverage of the region, but also some uh, some uh, academic publications or academic writings on the region. We can see the shifting mood over over the years and a very sharp contrast between the euphoria of 2011, the, the, the time of what was called the Arab Spring, especially the very early moment, the, let's say the, between uh, uh, the two first month of, uh, of 2011, when you had in uh, January, the, the fall of Ben Ali in Tunisia, and then in uh, February, uh, the fall of, uh, of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. So that brought the euphoria at a, at a very high point, at a peak. Uh, the, the spectacle of uh, Tahrir uh, Square in Cairo and all that, that, that has become you know, part of, of a major uh, uh, iconographic history, one could say, because the, 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 these uh, images are, are everywhere now. They became ubiquitous. And then this, uh, this idea that the occupation of the square became so important that we, 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 we found replicas or uh, a movement uh, inspired by it in, in various places, including uh, Occupy, the Occupy movement in the United States, for instance, uh, Occupy Wall Street. Um, and, uh, and others in, uh, in Spain, in uh, Greece, uh, in several countries. So we, we, there was a euphoric moment, I would say, in 2011. Um, but that was a euphoria based on a lot of illusions about what was happening. Uh, and just, I would say, tending to project on the region, maybe the... the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, a shape of events that had happened in other places, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, well, in the in the early 90s or late 80s, with the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and all that. So there was some tendency to 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 believe that this would be something akin to that, or at least to democratization processes that uh, occurred in the 80s in uh, East Asia, in Latin America. Um, not, uh, I, I think th th this illusion was based on, on a misunderstanding of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the deep roots of that, uh, of that upheaval, this big uh, uprising, and it spread to the whole region, actually, as, as we saw at the point. And also the, 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 the uh, um, probably a, uh, let's say, a lack of, uh, of uh, understanding of, of what, uh, of the kind of regimes you have in the region. And the fact that uh, uh, when the people want to overthrow the regime, Shab Yurid is Khatan Nizam, that the famous uh, slogan of those uprisings, well, changing the, the regime or the system, which is another possible uh, 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 translation of the term, uh, Nizam, uh, uh, I mean, it is a daunting task when you are facing such uh, repressive machines and repressive machines uh, uh, deprived of, uh, I would say, any moral sense. That is, you know, uh, the, the, the region has seen a lot of massacres. Uh, in, in, in various countries, uh, uh, and uh, and therefore the the, the issue uh, was definitely going to be much tougher and more difficult than uh, what uh, people believed uh, in uh, uh, in twenty in twenty eleven. Um, uh, add to that that uh, the, the the key the core issue was not what the media believed it to be, that is just a matter of, uh, of democratization. Although, of course, democracy and freedom were uh, very central. Uh, no, there's no dispute about that. But they were not the, uh, the, the most fundamental uh, cause of the uprising, which was rather uh, social and economic and structural. And the structure there, therefore, is not only the, the shape of the regime, whether uh, dictatorial, authoritarian, or, or whatever, but also the whole uh, um, uh, social nature of such states and the, the, the whole conditions that created a type of capitalism 
uh, uh, based on chronism, uh, nepotism, and uh, such uh, such features, which uh, resulted in a in, in the fact that uh, that part of the world uh, had the the uh, I mean lowest lowest uh, rates of growth among uh, uh, other I mean among uh, African and Asian regions. And that translated in the highest rates of youth unemployment in the world for, for uh, many years before 2011. And that, that, that this, these rates were actually, actually only increasing. And there was a gap between the rates of youth unemployment in the Middle East and North Africa and those of the rest of the world, a, a very significant gap. So these were the, the core reason of the explosion. And once one understood that, uh, one uh, uh, could only uh, uh, expect that this would be a very long historical process. I used that formula from the beginning, the uh, long-term revolutionary process. That, it is, that is, we have to understand it in terms of process, not in terms of a moment in history, and that's it. It's a process that will take a very long time, probably, I mean, uh, we're saying uh, maybe decades when well, we have already, we, are, we have already one, one decade of, of time and then uh, we, we, there will be uh, more of that. So what, what we can say is that uh, that was the beginning of a process that involves inevitably ups and downs, re, uh, upsurges and backlashes revolutionary moment and counter-revolutionary moment. That is the way historical revolutionary processes go. And that's what we had. And uh, two years after 2013, th that is, I mean, that can be confirmed even with the with a map or a, a graph of the, the, the intensity of the movements, but 2013 is a sharp drop. And it's a, a turning point, a uh, turning point from the first, let's say a revolutionary phase to a counter-revolutionary phase that was, um, that uh, I mean, uh, uh, was uh, signaled by the uh, Ira Iran's intervention in Syria to rescue the regime and therefore the, the counter offensive of the, the Syrian regime, then the, the, the coup, the military coup in uh, July, 2013 uh, in Egypt, uh, that was followed by also uh, uh, the return of uh, uh, old regime men in Tunisia uh, to government. Um, and uh, the, in the year after, uh, civil wars in uh, Libya and Yemen uh, involving uh, partisans of the old regimes uh, and, uh, you know, and the, the opposition. So, a degeneration, if you want, uh, and a violent one of uh, of the the, the 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 what happened in the, in the first phase, and then at that point, indeed, well, as you are saying, uh, you had a lot of uh, gloomy depiction, um, and uh, and you know, uh, um, ironic comments on the Arab winter, Arab autumn, you name it, um, and. Uh, and we, we, we had a, 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 a return, a comeback with a revenge of the Orientalist trope that, oh, this part of the world, you know, because of their culture, uh, democracy is not in their DNA, you know, they, 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 so they are uh, uh, addicted to despotism. That's part of their culture, this kind of Orientalist perspective. Uh, that was uh, shaken in 2011 when you had, you know, ingenuous uh, uh, statements saying, oh, after all, they are like the rest of us, you know, oh, oh, after all, they, 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 they are also longing for democracy and freedom. Uh, and then two years later, it was the, the, the setback into, well, okay, the, I mean, the, the, the culture is prevailing again, I mean, which of course is a very silly way of, uh, of, of looking uh, at, uh, at all that. So the, the uh, um, and, uh, and then, you know, there was this uh, uh, tendency to, to bury the movement, to, to, to proclaim that, okay, it failed, that, that is the end of it. But again, when you understand the long-term perspective, the historical perspective, uh, you understand that 
that uh, I mean, this uh, counter reversionary phase will be followed by new upsurges. And indeed, even during that phase, you, you I mean, the social protest carry, car, uh, carried on uh, developing uh, at a massive scale in several countries of the region, in Morocco, uh, in, in Sudan, in, uh, in Tunisia itself, actually. We had a number of social movements developing during or during the, the, those years, uh, until we reached uh, a new uh, uh, threshold or a new phase. Uh, in the year 2018, uh, first we had a, a, a large popular movement in Jordan, uh, which uh, was not as radical as radical as what we had in 2011, in the sense that. Uh, for including, I would say, for the, 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 for the, the, the risk of, of, uh, of saying it in a country like Jordan or any monarchy in the region, to, to, the risk of calling for the overthrow of the, the, the monarchy is terrible. So it was a movement limited to, uh, to, to, to uh, targeting the government and it uh, succeeded in, uh, in that. But then by the end of that year, December 2018, exactly eight years after uh, it all began in Tunisia in December 2010. Uh, it, uh, it began again in Sudan this time. You had a major uprising starting in Sudan in December 2018. And uh, in February 2019, it was followed by an, an uprising in Nigeria, a huge popular movement. Uh, and then October of the same year, Iraq, and then Lebanon, okay? So that made it uh, uh, four countries and you started having in the media again, the second Arab Spring, that, that formula uh, uh, emerged uh, in the media. Um, so, so already we had a second Arab Spring, if you want, I could say in, in re reply in response to, to, you, to your initial question that we had already two uh, springs, even though the, the second didn't have the same scope as the first, uh, but still, you have four countries. We had six in 2011. It was more dramatic in 2011, uh, but it, it was no less important in 2019. And if you think of it, that means that until now, 10 countries, 10 countries, it's, it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing, of this part of the world has, uh, have gone into uprising mode, major uprising mode. I'm not counting all the other countries or most of the other countries where you had uh, uh, very important uh, uh, upsurges in the social protest. But we're speaking of, of full uprisings. We have 10 countries out of, of, uh, of uh, I mean, in, in terms of state, you have something like 20 states uh, in, the, in, the, in the region. Uh, there are 20 states and actually uh, you should, one should count out of these 20 states, uh, countries and um, states like the United Arab Emirates or Qatar, uh, with very artificial condition where only 10% of the population uh, are citizens, right? And so you can't expect anything there. So that means that over the, 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 the rest of, of, of countries, the majority of the states of the region have until now witnessed major uprisings. And in terms of population, the, the, the large majority of the population of the region, because you have uh, the largest uh, country, I mean, in terms of population, Egypt has been involved, uh, Algeria, one of the largest countries has been involved, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, Syria, uh, <coughs> as an, an Iraq, I mean, we are speaking of, of, uh, of uh, many of the key countries uh, of, uh, of the region. So definitely, uh, 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 it's far from over, and I would say that what happened uh, to this last <clears throat> wave is different the, to, from what happened to the first. The first one ended in defeat and counter-revolution, backlash. This second one uh, was frozen, if you could say, by COVID. Mm -hmm. The pandemic is what blocked this uh, uh, unfolding of, of movements uh, in the four countries. Now, uh, with the effects, uh, the political effects, let's say, of the pandemic uh, starting to fade away, we are seeing a resumption of the movement. In Algeria, very recently, the, the movement that had been suspended for, for, for a year is, is resuming. 
Uh, in Sudan, it never actually really stopped. So, but uh, th there have been uh, demonstrations, there have been tensions, a lot of tensions in the country, and these are, are going to, to increase. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, Lebanon, because of the catastrophe, is seeing today um, a new explosion, albeit uh, under much, uh, let's say, uh, much, uh, much worse conditions than what existed in 2019. Um, so overall, uh, uh, the, there has been a, a suspension, not a, a termination with, uh, with COVID. And, and I will end with this. COVID itself, the economic crisis created by COVID is only worsening the deep roots, the deep causes of the, the, the major upheaval. And therefore, that, that is a, a, a further uh, uh, reason to, 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 to uh, uh, assert very categorically that uh, we, I mean, this is far from being the end of it. Actually, we are still in a, in some, in some way, we are still in an initial phase of this long, of this transformation that is absolutely um, indispensable in this part of the world and short of which, there won't be any new stabilization under despotic regimes. That, that, that is something that is extremely unlikely. Uh, uh, and therefore, the region is entered now 10, from 10 years into a long protracted period of, of uh, uh, instability and uh, all sorts of agitation. Uh, thank you. I remember interviewing you for our journal. Middle East Journal of Culture and Communication, which I edit, and uh, we did a special issue on the Arab uprising. And I remember you saying then, this is a long process, a long revolutionary process. So it's kind of almost prophetic, if one can use that, that term. But in terms of- I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I think it's just a matter of understanding the, the deep, because when, when you use such terms, uh, that would refer to something where you have to guess. You know, I don't think it was a matter of guessing. It's a matter of understanding the, the, what the problem is. When you have the correct diagnosis, then the prognosis follows and, 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 and is correct. That is, given the, 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 the nature of the crisis, this is something that can be solved quickly and rapidly and smoothly. It will be a very long process. And unfortunately also uh, one with a lot of violence. Yeah. And of course we, you know, there are popular mobilizations in Iraq that have been going on for quite a long time as well. Uh, again, you know, trying to ask for various demands. But, but this leads me to kind of asking um, whether these, you know, in, in a sense, what are the aims? It, it seems like uh, the aims of these new popular mobilizations are more, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, are more around economic and social equality, which you mentioned in your, in your uh, first book on the Arab uprising. So presumably these are the key concerns and, uh, and there are concerns around human rights and, um, and around freedom of expression, etc. Uh, but it seems to me like, particularly in the case of Lebanon, uh, social uh, and economic uh, inequalities that have been endemic for, and corruption uh, that have been endemic for a long time. They are now being, uh, you know, people are demanding uh, a, a, a way of dealing with them. Would... Um, I mean, I, I think from the start you have had a, a, a variety of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, focuses in, in the movements depending on the countries. And that, of course, reflects the, the nature of the political regime, the nature of the conditions in the country. Uh, uh, that is, in some countries, the movement started on social issues, uh, or, or actually in, in Tunisia, that was the, the, the beginning was on, on, uh, on uh, the, the, the let's say the, 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 the whole period preceding the, the uprising in Tunisia had seen uh, a rise in, 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 social, uh, 
in social struggles and also some political struggles to, to be sure. But uh, uh, when, when it exploded and uh, became a massive uh, uh, nationwide or statewide uh, popular movement, it, it inevitably became, of course, political. And uh, as Shab, you read the I mean, it, it, it became a matter of wanting to, to change uh, the system or the regime. Uh, um, uh, depend, I mean, when we look at, uh, at uh, the, 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 the second wave, uh, we can see also that in Sudan, it, it was triggered by uh, uh, the economic issue with uh, uh, the implementation of uh, IMF inspired measures by, by the, uh, uh, the dictatorial uh, government uh, of Omar al-Bashir. Uh, we see that in Lebanon also, it was triggered by an economic issue uh, and the attempt of the government to impose attacks on uh, voice over internet uh, communications. Um, uh, uh, in, uh, in Iraq, it was, uh, a lot of grievance on, on social economic, but also political issues. So, I mean, uh, whereas in Algeria, it was directly on a political issue, that is the trigger was not uh, economic, the trigger was political, that is the attempt of the uh, military to uh, renew uh, uh, the, for the fifth time, the uh, uh, presidential mandate of, uh, of Abdel Aziz Bouteflika. That's what, uh, what uh, led people to, to, to pour into the streets. So the, the trigger is different. Yeah, it can be social, it can be economic, it can be uh, uh, very directly political. Uh, but the, the, the key point is that the underlying cause of all that is the social economic uh, uh, blockage of the region. And of course, this social economic blockage create a lot of resentment against the whole system. You know? I mean, uh, when you have, we have, the region has had uh, dictator, popular dictatorships, one should say. For instance, in the 60s, uh, I mean, Nasser's Egypt was certainly not a democratic state. It was definitely also a military uh, uh, police kind of dictatorship, but it was undeniably popular because it was, uh, 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 because of its social economic achievements, the, the, the major social economic reforms, and also, uh, uh, the national, the, the confrontation with Israel, with, uh, with uh, uh, Western powers, with the United States, all that uh, uh, made the, the regime uh, undeniably popular. You know? um, so so uh, even the, the protest against dictatorships is something that is related to social economic conditions, uh, which create discontent. Uh, they can be in the, uh, of also of, of different uh, orientation. I mean, uh, sometimes you may have uh, uh, protests against dictatorships out of, of uh, uh, I mean, as a result of uh, 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 the development of a country, the modernization of a country, the development of, uh, of uh, let's say, some kind of modern middle class and the rest, the, 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 the development in size of the working class. Uh, we've seen such democratizations happening in countries like Brazil or South Korea, to, to just uh, to name but two here, yes? But what we have in the region is the other side, is the other type, it is not, democratize, not a, a democratization process uh, um, crowning uh, a, 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 a a historical period of development and economic growth and modernization. No, what we had is, is a, a, a blockage and this blockage is what led to the uh, explosion. In, in that sense, this is closer to what you had in Eastern Europe where you had also economic blockage within the Soviet Union and the Eastern Europe, except that there, uh, uh, the, the, the nature of the regimes uh, was very special no property classes, bureaucrats running, and the, those were not uh, uh, or did not uh, engage into any uh, very violent confrontation with the mass movements, believing each one of them that they could recycle their, uh, their know-how in a, in a market economy. Uh, whereas in, in the part of the world we are discussing, uh, you have not only property classes as you may have elsewhere, that is capitalist landowners 
but, et cetera. But you have also a number of countries in the region which, uh, in which the state itself is owned by family. You know, family rule of the state itself. And that is not only the case of the monarchies, but also of the, the, the so-called uh, Republican monarchies or monarchical republics that we had in the region like uh, Syria, the Assad regime in Syria, like uh, the, the <clears throat> Gaddafi uh, regime in Libya, or the, uh, the Saddam Hussein regime in Iraq, uh, even though that one was uh, uh, overthrown by uh, the US-led occupation in 2003. Um, so, you know, when we were thinking about when, you know, one of the issues around the first wave, uh, let us say, uh, 2011 was the question of the surprise element uh, that uh, people were very surprised that uh, or commentators um, were very surprised that uh, popular protests were so huge uh, and that they had happened in such conditions. Um, at the moment, when we are looking at the uh, popular mobilizations and uprisings that are taking place in different parts of the Arab world, I myself, as someone looking at you know, the media space, as a space where all these uh, mobilizations are also taking place, it is really uh, very difficult uh, to come up with um, a, a consensus on, what, you know, on, on the different triggers for these mobilizations. So in a, but, but I really appreciate your point around the fact that, well, it's not about one thing, but they're all uh, linked to the question of um, socioeconomic uh, positions and uh, property issues and uh, issues related to who holds the power, you know, sort of these, um, these uh, family owned, uh, you know, kind of uh, regimes uh, that have continued. But I want to ask another question, which is, in a sense, so for me, looking at the media, at the media uh, scene, and it's it's very confusing. It's it, it's uh, because you 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 know you cannot concentrate on on everything because you have uh, you know women taking part in different uh, forms of uh, popular mobilizations, young youth people. But the interesting thing is the uh, is the uh, uh, you know multiplication and and so many and numerous numbers of uh, uprisings or maybe uh, demands that are coming through social media at this time, you know, in, in this uh, new, um, new, in these continuous waves uh, of uprisings. But I wanted to ask a question uh, related to whether you think uh, or whether it is, um, it is, um, you know, whether you think that these new uh, popular mobilizations have learned some lessons from the first ones. So, is there are there is there any kind of uh, change in in the ways they are, um, or or in the in, in the ways that they are organizing, or in the ways that they are, um, you know, trying to uh, respond to power in different ways. Oh, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. This is a, a very important issue that you're raising. Um, um, well, you started speaking of media. I don't know if at that level the, uh, there is much uh, uh, difference. I, I would presume that there is not much difference in the sense that there, is, there hasn't been a technological change. Uh, maybe some uh, applications are more used today than they were in 2011. Uh, that may very well be the case. I presume the WhatsApp, for instance, something like that, uh, just to, to, to give an example. But uh, other than that, uh, already in 2011, we were in this uh, era of uh, the, the, the new uh, uh, information and communication technology. And uh, that was very much uh, used to the point that uh, it was described that, well, that was exaggerated, but not uh, devoid of any truth. Uh, it was described as a Facebook revolution at that time, as we all remember. Um, right, so maybe at this level, there hasn't been much change, but uh, uh, there, the, the differences between 2019 and 2011 are, 
um, uh, are quite uh, uh, visible. There are uh, a number of them. There is the there are the, the political uh, uh, differences, uh, which uh, uh, are a result of the fact that historical processes of revolution are, in terms of experience, in terms of knowledge, are cumulative. That is, they are learning curves. So people don't repeat the same mistakes if, 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 the, if, if uh, I mean, uh, if they, they have been uh, uh, um, made uh, just uh, a few years uh, before. They, they have them in, in memory, in the historical memory. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, in this case, probably the, the most blatant uh, difference is the, uh, the, 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 the way the, the people uh, uh, behave towards the military in Sudan and in Algeria compared to Egypt in 2011 and 2013. <clears throat> so whereas in Egypt, the, the popular movement had a lot of illusions about the military, both in 2011 and then in 2013, uh, uh, in, uh, we see that uh, in Sudan and Algeria, uh, these illusions were not repeated. And uh, uh, these three countries together represent the, the three countries where the armed forces are the central institution in the political system. Uh, the, uh, the, this is the particularity of the three countries uh, in, uh, in, in the region. And we see how strikingly similar the scenario has been in each of one, where the armed forces end up removing the president. The armed forces removed uh, Mubarak, and then Morsi, 2011, 2013. And the armed forces removed al-Bashir and, uh, and removed Bouteflika. So uh, in, Alger in Sudan and Algeria, or Algeria and Sudan chronologically. So, uh, uh, but the, the, the popular movement had a very different reaction, which was, you know, a full defiance and, uh, and uh, against the, the military not at all cheering up for the military for what they done and you know and praising them because they removed the president as the military expected i'm i'm sure in both sudan and algeria they expected to 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 be hailed for what they, they've done and what they found is a popular movement saying well that's one step forward but uh, what we want is a civilian uh, uh democracy and uh, and uh, mid the military out of politics you know and uh, and that's that's a very important difference. And here I think there is the, the learning curve uh, is quite uh, clear that because people saw uh, what Egypt had become in 2014, 15, 16, when when 20, 2016 the, the the Sisi regime started the, the 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 most radical implementation of the IMF uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, advocated. Uh, reforms which led to a, a huge rise in, in the cost of living and the, the cost of food and the rest. I mean, it, it had devastating effect uh, and also the devaluation of the, the currency, really de devastating effect on the population. But th that you had this, this uh, very repressive regime, which actually is much more repressive than what the Mubarak regime was. So, People understood that lesson in both uh, Sudan and Algeria and, uh, and are carrying on uh, uh, the struggle, never stopped it for, for one thing, kept demanding uh, a civilian uh, uh, government. Uh, we have also a difference, uh, I would say, uh, in the political configuration. And uh, that's here in that regard, it's also, I mean, it's a result also of, of, uh, of uh, um, let's say, historical changes, but also of the specific kind of situation that you have in uh, at least three, but actually in the four countries, in the sense that um, uh, the, the Islamic fundamentalist forces, the Muslim Brotherhood and the like, uh, that managed to uh, um, to jump on the the, the, the wagon the, the, the bandwagon in uh, in 2011 to hijack the movement and steer it 
uh, in their own uh, uh, preferred uh, direction because they were by far the most uh, organized, the most important uh, component of the opposition. Uh, and they had television backing with Al Jazeera. This is a, uh, an issue that you know better than I know, that's your field. Uh, and we know how, how much this is important in, uh, in politics, of course, it's hugely important, uh, even if you have now internet and the rest, and, uh, and, and money, of course, funding and all that. And also Turkey uh, jumped in into also uh, uh, supporting them. So they managed with all the support and all that, they managed to, 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 uh, to uh, come to the, uh, to, to, to get hold of the, the helm, you know, the, 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 to be at the wheel uh, of, of the first phase. But then they suffered a very heavy defeat. Uh, in Egypt with the coup, uh, in, uh, in Tunisia, where it wasn't, uh, fortunately, it wasn't, it was much smoother, but they, they were politically defeated. Uh, and then in, uh, in Libya and Yemen, where the, the governments in which they participated uh, were faced uh, civil war and, uh, and you know, um, and uh, other complications. Uh, so th that was the first phase. Now in the first, in the second way, we see a very different picture because uh, as I said, also of the nature of the governments, Sudan's uh, military dictatorship, unlike the one in Egypt, has been uh, 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 very closely work, uh, collaborating with the Islamic fundamentalists. Now it's true that even in Egypt, and people forget that uh, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood have been very severely uh, suppressed, uh, but the Salafists are there and are uh, supporters of the regime of Sisi. Uh, now in, uh, in, in Sudan, the, the whole spectrum of Islamic fundamentalist forces was supporting the regime, was involved in the regime. And therefore they were not in the popular movement uh, and, the, and there, was, there was no way they could, they could uh, steal that, that movement or hijack it. That was strictly impossible. The movement is very much against them too. Uh, that's for Sudan. Uh, Algeria, uh, the, the <clears throat> you have had uh, 10 years of terrible civil war in the 90s with uh, 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 extremist fraction of, uh, of Islamic fundamentalist forces. I, I'm not going into details because there, were, there are huge suspicion about the role of the military intelligence itself in, in, uh, in, in creating maybe that situation, but Ever, never, the, the key point is that it discredited these forces and then the, the more moderate, which are <clears throat> uh, uh, linked to the Muslim Brotherhood, actually were participants in the government of Bouteflika. They, they, they participated uh, uh, at, uh, I mean, intermittently in the, in the government. And so they were not in a position to, to, to be, you know, uh, here again in the, uh, uh, in the mass movement, and even less to 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 uh, uh, to, to to ambition to, to 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 steer it, to hijack it, or whatever. And then, if you look at Iraq and Lebanon, well, here we again we have governments in which Islamic fundamentalist forces are the the, the, the actually the, the the key force. Uh, the, the I mean Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, and several uh, organizations, uh, armed groups uh, in Iraq that have in common their very close relations to Iran, to the Iranian regime. And uh, these are uh, the, the key forces in government in both countries. And that's why the uprisings in these countries were against these forces as well as the rest. And these forces uh, took part or played a key role in trying to repress the uprisings, uh, more even than the official uh, repressive uh, forces of the government. So, uh, so this is another uh, uh, difference, major difference. And finally, last but not least, uh, you have seen a, a more important role of women in this uh, second wave. Uh, uh, Sudan, uh, especially where uh, the women were even a majority in the popular movement, 
even though when it came to representation in, uh, in uh, governing bodies and the rest, uh, uh, this was not reflected and the feminists very rightly uh, protested against this situation. But still, the, the role of women has been very important. We have seen an important role of uh, feminist organization in Tunisia in 2011. We have seen an important role of, of uh, important participation of women even in Yemen 2011. But in 2019, that was even bigger. In Algeria also, in Lebanon, uh, the women were uh, more visible at the forefront of the uprising than, 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 than men. Uh, and that even influenced Iraq, which traditionally has been a country where the condition of women was much more uh, difficult, uh, but uh, this led to uh, an increased participation of young women students uh, in, in the movement. So this is also a, a difference. So we see differences, there are differences. And I would say the, the, the three differences that I mentioned are steps forward, right? Uh, where we still have the big problem in the region is in terms of the organization of the popular movement around the kind of aspirations that are uh, shared and common to, to all these movements. And in that regard, I see one uh, exception, um, which is Sudan, which has been until now in all the 10 uprisings that we have seen in the region, uh, the, the, the most advanced in terms of uh, organizational uh, uh, structures is, is, uh, is Sudan where the movement is uh, led by, by two, uh, um, two, two, uh, two kind of organizations. One which has the, the, uh, the role of uh, representing the movement or leading officially the movement and which is, uh, uh, well, it was something called the professional association but uh, it, it now involves much more than professionals. To, uh, it involves uh, labor unions of all kinds. Uh, it has become a leadership of the working movement, the labor movement, the, the popular movement, all this together. And uh, we have a grassroots organization of the youth uh, called the resistance committees, which is completely imp uh, impressive, which uses a lot the media, by the way. It's very much, it uses very much in their expression their communiques and all that are not websites, they are Facebook pages, right? And they post their, their position. And you have uh, uh, several such resistance committees involving hundreds of participants, each one. And you have uh, you know, hundreds of such committees involving hundreds. So that gives you an idea of, of the very big size of that. Uh, uh, there, there is no central leadership. They are, uh, and that is a general, uh, I would say feature of, of the new generation, not only in the region, but even globally, there is some strong reservation uh, towards anything like centralism, uh, party leadership and things like that. And this is understandable given the uh, very poor uh, uh, balance sheet of the 20th century forms of organization. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, thanks to, to the, these ways of communication, they managed to coordinate their positions in an impressive manner. So this is very advanced. We haven't seen anything like this in the region. In Syria, at the very beginning, you had the local coordination committees, which uh, approach that kind of thing. But uh, due to the very repressive conditions from the start, they uh, were nowhere near the, the size of what we have today in Sudan. So that's a very interesting development. But here that points to a key problem, a key issue for the future of this long-term revolutionary process, the condition without which this won't lead to any positive outcome, which is this ability to find ways to, uh, of organization uh, uh, and representations that have le the legitimacy of real popular support and consent, that is very crucial. Yeah, I think the Sudanese case is very interesting. I had one of my students who's Sudanese spoke about it uh, in English. <clears throat> um, moving ahead, I'm, I'm really pleased that you mentioned the woman. One, one issue around women in, uh, in Iraq, uh, 
of the mobilization of the, you know, what is called digital harassment. Uh, that, you know, that is the problem of kind of opening media, the, the open media spaces, is that they are threatened and digitally harassed, that some of them are unable to leave and go out to protest. But I want to have a last question before we open the session, which is um, in relation to the apparent kind of, what is the word, largely indifferent uh, international community uh, or attention by the global communities to what is happening in, to what is happening in the region. So we don't see, we, we, you know, we don't see a lot of engagement with that. So perhaps, you know, if you could comment on that before I take questions from the audience. Um, to be frank, I'm not sure uh, it is, it was the case because if you remember 2019, there has been a lot of attention actually. Uh, and most of the global media started speaking of the global revolt because the events in the uh, Arab uh, or the Middle East and North Africa uh, coincided with uh, other uh, upsurges of social protest uh, from Latin America, Chile, Ecuador, and other countries to Hong Kong, you know, through the, the Europe, the Gilets Jaunes in France, major movement, uh, what you had uh, in, in, in MENA, uh, uh, um, Iran had uh, also uh, important uh, upsurges. So this looked very much like uh, a global, uh, you know, uh, wave of protest um, uh, in which the, the, the local, the, the, the second wave of the long-term process in the region uh, uh, was uh, or, or happened to, 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 to to, uh, to, to partake. Um, so no, I think that there was uh, uh, quite a lot of attention paid actually. Well, of course it's uh, proportional to countries. That is when you have Egypt and Tahrir Square, the attention of the world is different from what you have in, when, when it is in Tunisia you know, uh, or a country like uh, Lebanon. Uh, and yet there, there has been Quite, uh, quite. A, I mean, a lot of attention about Algeria, for instance. Then it depends on the country. For instance, in French-speaking countries, uh, France, Belgium, and the rest, attention on uh, uh, to what was going on in Algeria was higher than Britain or, or, or even more so than the United States. But still, that was also in the news. So we can't say no. I don't think that. Uh, uh, these, I mean, the, the, the movements were ignored uh, because I think, uh, I mean, this, this part of the world, uh, uh, understandably for, for everyone, is, is such a strategic and important, uh, and, uh, uh, and you have so many foreign powers, and that's, I mean, related to, what, uh, to, to, this, to the, 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 the same reason, you have so many foreign powers interfering here that, that there is, there is uh, quite a lot of attention, I would say. That's fantastic. Um, I, if, is it, if it's okay to start taking questions from the audience, is that okay? Sure. Um, Absolutely. Just post your questions uh, in the question and answer, uh, you know, kind of thing at the end of the Zoom. So, one question for you the future prospects for Libya. Who? Oh. The future prospects for Libya? Ah, um, well, I would reply to that first by, by trying to, to sketch very briefly how I see things uh, that things developed in Libya. Just a, re a reminder, uh, we've had a, a popular uprising uh, emboldened by the Tunisian and uh, uh, Egyptian uh, examples. Um, uh, you know, to, to both countries are uh, adjacent to, to Libya, so, so I mean, Libya could only be uh, taken into the, 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 the surprising mode that uh, the two neighbors, uh, Egypt and, and Tunisia, had gone through. Um, and, uh, and of course, diff I mean, with the difference in the nature of the regime, which is one, you know, a regime, uh, family-owned, uh, very centralized dictatorship, 
very peculiar also kind of autocracy uh, with the family control of the, the and tribal control of the, the armed forces and the rest, uh, the, 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 the uprising was met with violence very quickly and all that. And uh, then that led to foreign intervention uh, in an attempt to, uh, or the, 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 with the proclaimed desire to, uh, to prevent the massacre that was, uh, uh, um, I mean, promised by Gaddafi to Benghazi, the second city of, of the country, uh, in the east of the country. Um, but uh, then this intervention turned into an attempt at uh, controlling the movement um, uh, with uh, intensive efforts to, to steer it politically, uh, which failed completely when it, uh, it, uh, uh, the, 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 up, the uprising uh, occurred in the capital city itself and led to the collapse of the whole state. So the result was that Libya is the only country in the region where the people really overthrew the regime in the deepest sense of the regime that the whole state collapsed. But then that led into a, a you know, an anarchic situation with no, no real center of power, but, but multiple armed groups and the rest. And nevertheless, the year 2012 saw real elections with a high participation under conditions of real freedom of people to participate or not. And that was a, the, the moment, a democratic moment, but it did not last for the reasons uh, you mentioned that, that you had uh, various regroupments of forces and then uh, uh, the, the political um, uh, 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 clash became a military one and the, the country fell into a, uh, a war, even though it's a low intensity war, if we compare it to Syria or Yemen, where there you have much more tragic wars, even for geographic reasons in Libya, it's much less, you know, that the, the, it's a country with a, a very large uh, stretches of in, in, uh, uninhabited land between the cities and all that. So, um, uh, and it led to a division between uh, uh, one side represented by Haftar uh, involving uh, uh, forces that were part of the previous regime, uh, involving also Salafists, by the way, uh, and uh, backed by the Sisi regime in Egypt, by the UAE, uh, by Russia, uh, through so-called mercenaries who are actually uh, uh, how to say, uh, semi-official uh, troops of the, the, the Russian government, in fact. Uh, uh, so this, these forces uh, are on the side, and, and France uh, uh, shipped in also in, uh, with some uh, hesitation in, in, supporting, in supporting Haftar. On the other side, you had a coalition of forces with the Muslim Brotherhood at the center, backed by Qatar and Turkey, and you had this international, uh, rec internationally recognized government with UN um, attempts at, you know, uh, achieving some kind of compromise. Um, and I would say that in the region, uh, the worst scenario in the region are, are, are those clashes between Islamic fundamentalist forces and old regime forces because they, can, they become also very bloody, as we see in Syria, you know, et cetera. And, uh, and that's not going to advance the, popular, the progressive popular movement. So, uh, I mean, it's better for everyone if they can reach some kind of coalition agreement uh, to stop the wars, that's already something, and therefore recreate conditions under which a popular movement can, can progress. So now there's a new attempt uh, at, uh, achieving this kind of uh, compromise, which won't solve any of the economic, social problems and all that uh, in the country, but at least if it stops the war and uh, leads to, to conditions under which uh, uh, um, social struggles uh, could develop, that, that, would be, uh, that would be a positive outcome in my view. That's what I can say.
Now, what will happen? It's everybody's guess. You know, it's uh, just impossible when you have such a number of forces, such a number of foreign sponsors, and each of these foreign sponsors is likely to change their positions depending on their the 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 the, 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 the connections between them. And sometimes you have, you know, a change of president in the United States can change completely the condition. So you have so many changing factors in the equation that uh, any attempt at predicting an outcome anywhere is doomed to fail. And if, if, if ever a prediction uh, proves right, it's more like, you know, the, 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 the clock that is uh, uh, not working, but uh, uh, which is uh, twice a day uh, gives the right time twice a day, you know, because because it's not, so that's that's exactly the point. Um, that's what I can say about Libya, uh, uh, and um, everything will will uh, I think uh, will uh, or it depends on on all these these uh, conditions that I mentioned. So so much that uh, no prediction is possible except that. For the whole region, there is no uh, real stability in, in sight. That is, even if they you get a compromise and all that, that won't solve the social problem. And then you will have a continuous uh, uh, social protest. As you can see today, if you look at Syria, even the, in the although the regime appears as having won the battle, except for the region of Idlib. But now you see in the areas controlled by the regime, like Suede and the rest, we have seen a flare up of social protest. It's, 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 it, it will carry on. Uh, thank you. And this seems to answer the questions because there's a few questions around foreign intervention uh, and questions around, you know, could you, uh, but perhaps you could speak a bit more around the situation in Lebanon. Uh, there's a couple of questions wanted to say, what are your reflections on, on Lebanon uh, currently? And whether you see uh, there is some new way that uh, the, 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 the protesters or uh, the people engaged in the popular mobilizations, perhaps they are moving or understanding statecraft in a different way and responding to it in a different way. So I wonder whether, yeah, you could comment on the Lebanese situation and uh, yeah. yeah, well, I'm afraid uh, I don't have uh, any uh, optimistic uh, or you know positive uh, appraisal assessment of what's going on now in Lebanon. Uh, there was a huge, a hugely important moment in uh, 2019, in October 2019, the the, the initial uprising which uh, was uh, amazing in managing to uh, cross, uh, to, to, to develop across uh, um, uh, sectarian cleavages uh, in the, and regional cleavages in the country, encompassing practically all parts of the country and all, and people of all sects. And uh, that was also, I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, the condition of, uh, for that was also that the movement was against uh, members of the ruling class of whatever, whichever uh, sect uh, they, 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 uh, you, you find in the, in the country. All of them means all of them was the, the, uh, the central slogan of, of that uh, uh, uprising moment, right? However, uh, uh, there is a much less, homogeneity or agreement in the movement in Lebanon on what people are standing for than on what people are standing against. They are against kullun, yani kullun, all, the, all of them means all of them. But when it comes to, to the, the conception of what should be replacing them, here you have very different views uh, because the movement is very heterogeneous socially uh, class-wise, if you want, uh, politically, uh, ideologically, in any sense. And so it, uh, there were attempts at creating structures and all that, but uh, they uh, were not uh, uh, successful. And therefore, uh, that facilitated the role of the various sectarian 
components of the ruling class to re, I mean, to take back control, at least in part, of, uh, of their constituencies. Um, and uh, uh, so that, that's, that's one point. And, and there has also been a sense of, uh, of uh, um, despair or uh, in the face of, of, I mean, when you see that uh, one of the, the key stumbling block is represented by Hezbollah, which is an armed force, which is stronger than the government and can be more repressive than the official government. And that is also a major, major concern. However, and at least I want to end on this with, uh, with some more positive note. In the very recent uh, weeks, we have seen the development of a very promising uh, uh, student movement. Uh, uh, across uh, universities, private universities, and then moving to the, the public universities. Uh, their name is the, the, the Secular Clubs. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, I mean in, in, the, in the Lebanese context, that means a rejection of sectarianism, basically. And, uh, and they have really progressive aspirations. They are expressing them. We have, there have been some political expression of that. Uh, there have also been some uh, movements that started building up in, uh, uh, in 2019, uh, like uh, Lihaqi, uh, you know, movement of that kind, young, uh, involving essentially young people with the progressive aspirations. So there are attempts, they are promising, but for the time being, for the, uh, for the wave, if you want, that started in 2019, um, I can't see uh, that uh, leading to, in itself, to any change. The change in Lebanon for now is, depends here more than Libya, uh, I would say, uh, on international uh, players. You know, uh, basically, uh, the Iran-U.S. relation, the state of the relation between Washington and Tehran is what has the, the most important consequences on the situation in Lebanon. Thank you. So there's a question around, uh, there's a question saying that the first phase of the Arab uprisings were perhaps displaying some signs of pan-Arabism. Uh, do you believe that was right, that there was this idea of a pan-Arab movement? And um, then uh, a related question whether this is also, you know, coming through in, in the current wave or in the second wave. So question related to uh, pan-Arab identity or uh, pan-Arabism. Yeah. No, I, <clears throat> I mean, pan-Arabism in, uh, in Arabic, uh, which is Arab nationalism, uh, um, I think it is an ideology that uh, uh, has made its time. It's, uh, you know, it, uh, it, uh, it, it lost, it completely lost impetus in the, uh, in the 70s. Um, and uh, when the regime that resulted from this shifted to the right, um, uh, all of them basically uh, through the 70s and 80s, all of them shifted to the right. Um, uh, so, uh, and uh, since all these regimes had in common their dictatorial character. Uh, so all, the, I mean, this, this legacy uh, has become very much discredited. Um, and uh, and uh, no, it didn't play any, any significant role. I mean, you had Nasserist here and there, but this identity, if you take Egypt, for instance, uh, uh, the, there was a, a very, um, very significant and, uh, uh, I mean, vote in 2012 for a candidate that is Nasserist. But uh, that was not because of the pan-Arabist uh, side of his ideology. It was more uh, the, the nostalgia of what Egypt was under Nasser the nostalgia of the social economic conditions under Nasser, the nostalgia of the national dignity of, the, of, this, uh, of Egypt and its role, in, not only in the region, but uh, worldwide 
as a leader of the non-aligned movement and the rest. So this is what plays more uh, in that case. It's not uh, the, uh, the pan-Arabist idea itself. Now, the fact that we are speaking of a, a movement that is developing in Arabic speaking countries and all of them, that led to a renewed awareness of the belonging to a geopolitical culture also. And uh, for some, they would call that national, but there's no uh, time and space here for, for such debates. But the key point is that, yes, I mean, in this, uh, the sense of the, the, the conscience of a belonging to a region with, with a lot of things in common is there, has been enhanced with what, uh, what we are seeing, that doesn't mean that there is any uh, role for pan-Arabism in that, except very marginal uh, groups here and there participating. Um, now, for the region, if one has to think of, uh, of unity for the future, that would be more in, in the sense of what you have in the European Union, you know, uh, that is a confederal kind of, uh, of organization, uh, of, of the states of the region than any of the all the dreams of uh, of the the uh, unification a la, a la Bismarck or a la, uh, Victor Emmanuel or I mean like the unification of uh, Germany or or Italy uh, that won't happen uh, no but uh, what we may see are more democratic forms that would be for the future but for that before that you need a positive outcome for what is going on into a real democratization of the whole region to have therefore the possibility of a really democratic confederation of states. There's a good question about Sudan asking uh, whether you could tell us more about the labor movement uh, in, in, in the Sudanese context and whether this new you know, movement, I think you mentioned it's, it's a professionals uh, but does it, uh, is there a new um, established labor force or is it union-centered? Is there, are there unions involved in it or are there parties involved, involved uh, in this organization? Right. Um, I, I'll be brief and refer you to the article I, I wrote for Le Monde Diplomatique, which is in open access in, in English uh, on Sudan. Uh, that was in... Uh, June, maybe uh, last year, uh, 2020, um, May or June, I can't remember, something like that. I visited, I went on a, we can say, fieldwork uh, visit to, to Sudan in February uh, uh, last year. And uh, yes, and so uh, the, I mean, the, the labor unions, uh, like in other dictatorial countries in the region, were under state control. Uh, but uh, what you had is a movement that uh, was created, was built underground, uh, by, started by professional associations involving, uh, I don't know, uh, doctors, uh, uh, journalists, uh, veterinaries, uh, all, all sorts of professional associations, and also teachers. Uh, whether the teachers are professionals, that's uh, debatable, especially when you, uh, when you, I mean, uh, you, you go beyond, uh, you, I mean, you, you don't only consider university or uh, uh, higher education teachers, but uh, more uh, basic education. Uh, so anyway, uh, you had the, these movement, they, they, they organized underground. And when the time came, they, in December 2018, they came to the fore and they became the organizing uh, body and also the spokes, uh, uh, they, they became the spokespersons of, uh, of the whole movement and their website and all that, their Facebook, their social media uh, became the center, the focus of, of what was happening. And <clears throat> with, the, with the unfolding of the uprising, and the fall of the dictators, you have a number of new unions being created. The labor movement was resuscitated in new forms and independent forms. Uh, recently, there was an adoption of a new uh, labor law, union law in the, in the country, which had been the center of a debate uh, over uh, the, the period since the uprising. So, uh, so now the, what is called the Sudanese Professional Association is in fact the, the epicenter of, 
of the whole uh, labor uh, working uh, people movement uh, in the country. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what uh, we can say about it. But uh, this article I mentioned is, is available uh, easily. It's easy to find it. Okay, so uh, a couple of questions around the persistence of uh, authoritarianism uh, in the region and a question on uh, what you think about Russia's role going forward or right now. Right. Uh, authoritarianism, I mean, uh, you know, to overthrow authoritarianism, you need an organized civil society, let's put it in those terms, that is a popular movement and all that, able to uh, 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 impose democracy. And uh, uh, there is one country of the first wave where this existed, and that was Tunisia, with the, uh, which had this particularity of being the only country in the region at that time, which had a powerful, organized labor movement, legal, that is not an underground one, and at the same time autonomous towards the government, especially at the levels of the rank and file and the intermediary level, but even not all its leadership was under state control. And this organization is actually the crucial reason that explains why it started, I mean, in Tunisia, that is why Tunisia was the first country to get rid of its head of state. That's thanks to the role that this organization played in transforming what was a, a, a local protest into a national uprising. It, they had a, a key role in that regard. And their existence is the, the key reason why of all the six uprisings and other movements that we had in 2011, the only one that led to a real democratization is Tunisia, right? And we can say today Tunisia is uh, the most democratic state in the region. Uh, it's not a perfect democracy, far from it, but compared to all the rest, it's definitely the most democratic. The one in which you don't know in advance the result of elections and, and the elections are really free and uh, may bring a lot of surprises. Uh, and this has been there for, for, for 10 years. It's not that uh, you have two years and then it's over. So, um, so th that, that's the key point. Now, Sudan is another country where this could be possible, except that they are facing a much tougher uh, obstacle than Tunisia. Tunisia, for historical reason, never had a strong military. The army was never central in Tunisian politics. Um, uh, whereas uh, in, uh, in Sudan, that has been uh, for the last uh, decades, you've had uh, uh, military dictatorships and the, the military are entrenched in the government, in power, in the control of all that. And they have a huge uh, privileges that they need to, that they want to preserve, like in Egypt, like in Nigeria. So it, it's much tougher, um, but uh, uh, so the, the struggle will carry on. And for the rest, that's the point. That is, as again, we, we get back to what I said, the condition for a positive outcome of all this historical process is the matter of organization of the popular movement. That's what will be uh, decisive uh, at the end of the day. And I think with this, you answered the question by Helen, where she was asking about uh, you know, the need for organization. Um, mm -hmm. There, there are two questions, one about um, prospects for Kuwait and Yemen, uh, you know, big questions. And uh, uh, I don't know whether you want to answer them. Uh, but, uh, and, and again, because you've got the Lebanese elections coming, you know, there's two questions around Lebanon. Uh, Lebanese elections in 2022, what, what kind of opportunities would these bring or maybe not opportunities in, in many ways? Yeah, well, you know, any question about prospects uh, uh, for the MENA region 
uh, should be solved by the local uh, uh, well-known means to uh, find out about prospects, which is uh, coffee. You know, you, you turn the, the, the cup of coffee and then you read, you read in it the future. Uh, uh, but uh, to be frank, because anyone pre pretending that they can predict uh, the future uh, would be, uh, you know, I mean, that, that, that's a pretense that doesn't make any sense. For the reasons I explained, there are too many factors involved. It's not a simple equation you know, where you can find the, the unknowns very, I mean, relatively easily. Here, no, they, they are changing. It's an equation with changing factors and they change for, for so many reasons, global, local, regional, everything. So it's not possible to predict. And uh, the only thing, as I said, the only safe prediction one can do for the whole region is the fact that what started in 2011 this destabilization of the region will carry on for a very long time. That's for sure. No stability in, in any foreseeable future, right? That's for sure. That's the only thing. Aside from that, no one can tell, right? Uh, except maybe for, even for the very short term, it's very difficult to, to, to make predictions actually in the region because it's so much uh, changing, so many states involved uh, and, uh, and the rest. Lebanese elections, uh, I don't know if there will be elections. And I mean, many Lebanese are wondering if there will still be a Lebanon in 22. You know, I mean, it's really tragic what you have in Lebanon. The, just to give you an example, uh, an indicator, uh, uh, before the, the crisis in 2019, the uh, dollar uh, was exchanged for 1,500 liras, okay? Now it has gone over 15,000 So from 2019 to now, it has uh, lost 90% uh, more of its value. It, it's collapsing. And uh, except for those who have dollars and fresh dollars as they call them in Lebanon, that is who get their dollars uh, from abroad, uh, for the rest, it's, it's uh, I mean, a, a completely unbearable situation. It's absolutely unbearable. And uh, so uh, it's, it's uh, I mean, uh, uh, to think of elections and all that would, 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 uh, would mean that you have had some kind of stabilization, some kind of, uh, of, of the economic crisis and the rest. I, I mean, no one can predict that. Again, it's the same issue. As I explained, it depends on international factors more than it depends on what is going on in Lebanon itself. And therefore, who knows what will happen from now until 2022. Um, thank you, Gilbert. I think we should end here. We're coming to the end of time. There were a few other questions, but uh, they're kind of repeating, uh, repeating the other ones. And what I wanted to say here is obviously, um, you know, there are all these external factors, but we also have the pandemic factor as well, which is, you know, kind of brings its own specificities for uh, the country, you know, for the globe in general, uh, but also for the region. Uh, but thank you all for all your questions and thank you, Gilbert, for this very stimulating discussion as always with you. And- Thank um, you, Nina. Um, yeah, there was a question about uh, Al Jazeera and so on. There's been a lot of stuff uh, written about Al Jazeera's role uh, in the uprisings. And there's a question about Iranian movement, uh, Ken. Uh, there's, um, if you look up the Middle East Journal of Culture and Communication, the, you know, there is a discussion around the green movement um, and the Arab uprisings, if you want to look at that. But obviously, you know, in terms of uh, the, the, the talk, I think we've had a very rich discussion. Thank you all for coming um, and have a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you very much. And thank you to Aki. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Aki. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.